Well, good evening and welcome joining us on Wednesday. Uh, I'm glad you're here, at least over the techno technological airways. We're glad you're there. Uh, looking forward to some more storms coming. Glad we were all safe uh, through the storms on Sunday, praying for those who were in the eye of them. Uh, we hope that this will end. I tell people all the time, that's why I'm not a fan of the spring. Cold and warm weather do crazy things. Uh, but we are glad that you're able to join us. We're praying for uh, you and for your safety. We're praying that God will continue to, uh, to uh, clear this virus throughout our airways to get people back to normal, get our economy back going, get us back going, get us back together again. We are really, really uh, looking forward to seeing you guys again. Let, with that in mind, we, we do have a couple of things going on. We have Mother's Day coming up. Do you believe in two weeks from Sunday, Mother's Day will be here? Maybe a strange Mother's Day for a lot of people. But what we want to do is something a little special. We would like for you, and you should be getting an email um, from Belinda today. We are trying to gather pictures of our moms. Uh, so all of our moms in our church to send us in a picture. Maybe it's with your children. Maybe it's just you. It doesn't matter. We'd like to do put together a montage that we can use in our service uh, on Mother's Day uh, Sunday morning. So you can email that in to us. There'll be some instructions. We're going to put out a Facebook post later today, too, as well, uh, letting you know um, what uh, what you need to do, what the instructions are to do that. If you have any questions, just call us here at the office, okay? Good. All right. Well, we're looking forward to that, uh, to try to give some kind of resemblance of normality in a crazy, mixed-up world that we're living in today. Sorry about the set, should be just squeezed in and you just see black behind me, but um, I'm the one doing this <laughs> by myself and I can't get it any better. But it's not about that, it's about the word. It's bad enough you have to look at me, just close your eyes and listen. Close your eyes and listen and imagine that it's somebody else prettier <laughs> giving it to you. All right, I love you guys and I miss you guys and anything I can do, please call me. Feel free to call me uh, and let me know, all right? Love you, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for your word that we're about to study and we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us in a unique way, giving us new revelation of who you are, Lord, and what you want from us. God, your word is so true. It's so impactful. Uh, just give us a new something we've never seen before. Uh, Lord, speak to our hearts through your Holy Spirit. We thank you for him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we've been talking about the great high priest and the superiority of that high priest, and now we're going to the new covenant. In chapter 8 of Hebrews, verses 1 through 13. Chapter 8 of Hebrews 1 through 13. He, he talks about in this, and we'll see it as we go, uh, right off the beginning, verse 1, now the main point, and what has been said is this, we have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Uh, the main point means just that in the Greek, the main, the chief point, not a summary as the King James suggests, What's given here is the primary thrust of what has already been said. This is what we've been emphasizing from the beginning. Uh, he says the, the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. He's saying there's a great many things that we have explained, that we've presented, and they all relate directly or indirectly uh, to Christ and to his priesthood. The primary focus of Hebrews chapter 8 is the new covenant. But as an introduction to this discussion uh, for the proper benefit of the covenant, he mentions two more indications of Jesus' high priest, uh, so being the superior high priest uh, of this covenant. First, seated at God's right hand, his seat. Uh, as mentioned before, back in Hebrews 10, uh, we talked about it in verse 11. We hadn't got there, but we've talked about it. It says, 
and every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away the sins. The priest's job was never done. They never sat down. Um, sacrifices had to be offered continually uh, because they were never permanently effective. They had to be repeated over and over again. And in this ministering at the altar, the priest never rested because he was never through. It was a constant. No place was provided in the temple uh, or the tabernacle for the priest to sit down. The mercy seat uh, on the Holy of Holies, it was not a seat. In any case, it would have been utterly blasphemous for the high priest, who was the only one that could ever go in there, to sit on the mercy seat. It represented God's throne and his special presence. When Jesus offered his sacrifice, he sat down, the Bible says. He was qualified to sit down. Why? Because his work was done. Some of the last words from the cross. It is finished, he said. He accomplished in one glorious act what all the priests of the old covenant had not accomplished and could never accomplish. Uh, what a marvelous and wonderful thing Jesus did in that one sacrifice, that sacrifice of himself. As far as our salvation is concerned, listen, he has taken a seat. He has done, he has accomplished everything that needs to be accomplished. It is finished. And yet there are still people out there who are trying to add to the magnificent uh, grace of God. Salvation by faith uh, is it, it's over and done. Jesus accomplished it. His work at the cross finished it. We don't add anything to it. It is the gospel plus nothing. The saving effort of the Lord needs no additives. Why? Because it was perfect. And this truth should have been the most joyful news for the Jews that they could ever imagine. A final sacrifice, a finished work, so that the high priest could sit down at the right hand of God. To sit down at the right hand of a monarch symbolized honor, exaltation, and power. To stand at his right hand was honor, but to sit, that would be the supreme honor. And Christ sat down at the right hand of the throne of thrones, God's heavenly eternal throne. Jesus has been given that place of honor. He has been ushered into that heavenly holy of holies. He's been seated with God on his throne. Even more amazing than that, as believers, we're invited one day to sit on that same throne. Listen to this, Revelation 3, 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. It is a tragic but a beautiful story from the book of Acts that comes to my mind of Jesus sitting at God's right hand. And it was when Stephen was uh, being martyred outside of Jerusalem, be stoned to death for preaching. And he's powerfully, I mean, he's waxing eloquently to the Sanhedrin council. And the Bible says in Acts 7.55, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. As far as redemption is concerned, Jesus is seated. Why? Because he rests from his finished work of redemption. But when one of his own falls into trouble, watch this, don't miss this, he stands up because he takes a position of action. His power and his energy are immediately activated on behalf of those that he loves. He stood as in applause for Stephen. He's seated as our Redeemer, but he is standing as our Helper. The fact that Jesus Christ in all of his glory, in all of his magnitude, in all of his exaltation in heaven is still preoccupied um, with ministering to us is an awesome and a wonderful and a very humbling thought. He is always serving. He is always interceding. He is ministering on our behalf for what we need. He did not recognize his majesty as something to be selfishly enjoyed. It, it is in Jesus Christ that that majesty and that service are perfectly joined. 
So the right hand of God. And then the sanctuary, verses 2 through 5. A minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Hence, it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God, when he was about to erect the temple for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. The sanctuary in which Jesus is a minister is infinitely superior to the one that the Jewish priests ministered in. Theirs was simply, uh, theirs was a hologram, if you will. It, it was a shadow of the sanctuary in heaven. Jesus doesn't minister in a temple of cedar and gold. He doesn't minister in a temple of white marble and, and beautiful and impressive as they were. This tabernacle was much less impressive than the one in heaven. When the writer of Hebrews was writing, the tabernacle uh, had not been used for a thousand years. Uh, the Herodian temple had about five years left before it would be destroyed by Titus in 70 AD. This book was written around 65, 66, 64 AD. But Jesus, his sanctuary is the true tabernacle. It's the one that the Lord pitched, not man, and which can never rot, it can never crumble, and it can never be destroyed. Look at verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, hence it is necessary that the high priest also have something to offer. Verse 3 begins the argument from the general to the particular. The question would likely come up at this point. If Christ finished his work and he is seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father, what does he have to do now? Is all of that priestly work finished? And as we touched just a moment ago, no, not really. His sacrifice is finished. His atoning work is finished. Uh, but his priestly ministry, it's not over. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Well, then Jesus, as the high priest, can do no less. He is truly a ministering uh, priest for us. He's already ministered in that that one final blood sacrifice was sufficient for all people for all time. Uh, the work of his... Uh, it, it, that's completely finished. You know, there, there's no need. There will never be. No other additional sacrifices. But the redeemed people uh, to come uh, to dedication, to commit themselves, that thanksgiving is not over. The praise and thanksgiving that Jesus continues to minister for us before the Father. The Bible says he ever intercedes for us. None of us can praise God. None of us can thank God. None of us commit and dedicate ourselves in worship and obedience and serving service to him. Watch this. Apart from Jesus. Just as no Israelite could offer a gift or sacrifice to God except through a priest, Christians can't do that except through our high priest. We cannot confess sin. We cannot seek forgiveness apart from Christ any more than we could have come to God apart from Jesus. Anything of any value, any consequence uh, that we do as believers is done through the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, Colossians 3 and verse 17, whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. It's obviously necessary then for Jesus to continue to minister on our behalf. He continually brings the gifts. What are the gifts? Our worship, our praise, our repentance, our dedication, the thanks of the hearts of his people. He brings all of that before the Father. Look at verses 4 and 5. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. See, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. If that temple were still standing, Jesus was here on earth, he would not be a priest at all. 
just like when he was here. He could not minister for us on earth in the terms of the old covenant. During that earthly ministry, he healed the sick. He raised the dead. He preached on the hillsides and in the synagogue. He forgave sin. He called himself God's true son, but he never claimed the right to minister in the temple. He didn't venture one step closer to the inner sanctuaries of the temple than any of the Jews of his day who were not priests. He was not of a priestly tribe, and therefore he wasn't qualified under the old earthly um, ministry. Watch this. God never mixes the shadow with the substance. He never mixes the type with the antitype. Jesus couldn't minister the old offerings in the old earthly sanctuary because he ministers the new offerings in the new heavenly sanctuary. That heavenly sanctuary is built by God, not by man. That heavenly sanctuary is the substance. It's not the shadow. So the tabernacle that was built under Moses' direction, according to the pattern, it was not the original model. It was just a type. It was, it was a, a set the pattern for a more elaborate uh, temple uh, than the immeasurably elaborate sanctuary that was in heaven. The heavenly sanctuary is not only enhanced, it's an improved version of the earthly, and, and just the opposite. The earthly was just a, a shadowy, it was shadowy. It was barely a suggested copy of the heavenly one. And it preceded the earth by eternity, the heavenly one did. It has always existed. The gifts, the sacrifices, the sanctuary, even the priests themselves, they were, they were copies and shadows of their heavenly counterparts. How many times have we read about what the scene in heaven looks like, whether it was in Isaiah chapter 6 or in, in Revelation 3 and 4? Or I'm sorry, four and five, we get this glimpse around the very throne room of God. A shadow has no substance in itself, no independent existence um, or meaning apart from what the shadow is cast from. It exists only as evidence of the real thing. So a copy uh, can be a helpful thing. A, a copy of a contract, for example. That would be helpful in a lot of ways uh, for checking out the names, the dates, the terms that were agreed upon uh, in a court of law. But only the contract, the real contract, only that one is valid. A copy is good for checking the terms, but a real contract is good for enforcing them. Why? Why then should anyone be satisfied with a copy when we have the real thing? That was the dilemma and that was the very thing that the writer of Hebrews was trying to convince the Jews of. Why be, why, why be satisfied with a copy? Why should you be satisfied with the old priesthood? Why should you be satisfied with the new priesthood? Why are you not longing for the new covenant? When real forgiveness and real reconciliation in Jesus Christ is made possible. And what old covenant priest could ever compare? to the high priest of the new covenant. Verse 6. But now he has obtained more excellent, a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on a better promise. Jesus' superior seat, his superior covenant, his superior sanctuary, these are all evidences of superior ministry. And this superior ministry is the evidence of a superior, of a superior covenant that he mediates, uh, which has superior promises. A mediator, or mestes, as it is in the Greek, means someone who stands between two people and brings them together. A go-between go during a dispute or a conflict. He represents both parties. A religion, in religion, a priest is the mediator between God and man. Many false religions have priests whose ministry is claimed to do just that, reconcile men to God or with the gods, plural little g. These are pseudo mediators because quite frankly, though they may represent men to some degree, they do not represent God. The old covenant with Israel had its mediators, 
it's ceremonial uh, matters, those were the priests and only the priest. Moses acted as a mediator of the Old Covenant. In a sense, the prophets were mediators of God's Word to Israel. The New Covenant not only has a better mediator, but it has better promises. All covenants are based on promises. That's what they are. Sometimes the promises uh, are only by one party. Sometimes they're by both. Sometimes the promises are conditional. Sometimes they are not. But the promises are always involved. As far as God's covenants are concerned, it's always his promises that were significant. Men break theirs. God can't. The benefits and the power are always from God's side. And therefore, the significant promises are always from his side. Consequently, consequently, it is God's promises in the new covenant that are called better. Look at verses 7 and 8. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with him, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Think about this. The old covenant was not false, but it had faults. F-A-U-L-T-S. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there'd have been no reason for a second one. Its faults, its limitations, had even been pointed out by Jeremiah the prophet. Hebrews 8, 8 through 12 with the exception of the first few words of verse 8, is a direct quotation from Jeremiah. Listen, the writer says, look what your own scriptures have to say about the advantages of the new covenant. You should have been expecting a new covenant to come, and you should already have known that it would be superior to the old. One of your greatest prophets told you hundreds of years ago, yet millions of Jews today are still hanging on tenaciously to an old covenant even though their own scriptures through their own beloved prophet has been telling them for over 2,000 years that a newer one was to come. They're holding on to a covenant they can't even practice any longer. No temple, no covenant practicing. The quotation from Jeremiah had eight factors that showed that the new was superior to the old. First, written by God. A will is a type of covenant. It illustrates beautifully God's covenants with people. Though many people may be involved in the provision, the will is written by one person. The one whose will it is. The beneficiary has no part in determining the benefits. He can only accept or reject. He cannot change what the will provides for him or her. The new covenant in Christ, uh, the Messiah, he is based solely on God's sovereign terms. He says, I will effect a new covenant. That's what the Lord said to Jeremiah. It's one going to be different from the old. Just as that covenant in Christ is new and it's better, it, it makes it obvious that it should be different to some extent. I mean, if it was the same thing, the same old thing, it wouldn't be a better covenant. It's not just enhanced or modified. It's not slightly different. It's radically different from the old one. As I mentioned, um, it's like the old in that it was sovereignly made with the same people. But its basic nature and provisions are totally different. God, in effect, he effected a new covenant which was not like the covenant I made with our fathers. Verse 9. It was made with Israel. That, that, that's important. That's very, it's another one of the factors, the third factor. He made it with Israel. The new covenant was based with Israel. He says in verse 8 and 10, I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. God has never made a covenant with the Gentiles. Hello? You and I? He's never made a covenant with Gentiles. Far as we know, he never will. The new covenant is not made with, uh, with the church. As some people think that. The new covenant is still made with Israel. 
yet Gentiles are the beneficiaries of the new covenant. Just like we were to be beneficiaries of the old covenant. Both covenants were made with Israel alone. Israel as a nation rejected God by rejecting his son, but God has never rejected Israel. And he has transferred his covenant uh, or, um, or has not transferred his covenant with her to anybody else. The original and the basic name for the Jewish nation is Israel. When the tragic division of the kingdom happened, two parts, you remember it was divided into two parts. You, uh, you had Israel, uh, which was the northern kingdom, and Judah, uh, the southern kingdom. But the 12 tribes together are always called Israel or Israel and Judah. And as already mentioned and is abundantly clear from the New Testament, Gentiles by faith share in the benefits of the gospel on an equal basis with the Jews. Gentiles could not share in the Mosaic Covenant or even really share in the Abrahamic Covenant because all the nations of the world would be blessed in Abraham, but none of these covenants were made with Gentiles. Why? Jesus said of himself, Jesus said, John 4, 22, salvation is from the Jews. And so when Gentiles are saved, we become descendants of Abraham. We become spiritual descendants. Listen to Galatians 3, 7 and 8. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of the faith who are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All nations shall be blessed in you. The Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled in each of us when we accept the single requirement of the new covenant, that is faith in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise, Galatians 3 and verse 29. Here's another thing about the new covenant. It's not legalistic. Look at verse 9. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. The blessings of the old covenant were conditioned on Israel's obedience to the law that God gave them with the covenant. And because Israel did not continue, God did not care for them. Under the law, his care depended on her continuance. Her disobedience did not change the covenant or forfeit the blessings of it. It was a covenant of law, but it's different with a new covenant. It is eternal, not external. Verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after the days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The new covenant will have a different sort of law. It is an internal, not an external. Everything under the old economy or old covenant was primarily external. Under the old covenant, obedience was primarily out of fear of punishment. Under the new, it's out of adoring love and worshipful thanksgiving. Formerly, God's law was given on stone tablets. He told them, write it on your wrist, write it on your foreheads, you know, write it on your, your, um, your doorpost as reminders in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Even when the old law was given, of course, it was to, uh, intended to be on people's hearts. But the people couldn't write on their hearts. They could write on their doorpost. But at this time, the Holy Spirit, the only changer of hearts, had not been given to believers yet. But the spirit writes of God's laws on the minds and the hearts of those who belong to him in this new covenant. This true worship is eternal, not external. It's real, not ritual. This covenant is also personal. Verse 11, they shall not teach every uh, one his fellow citizens and everyone his brother saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. Being internal, the new covenant is personal. It is personal not only in God's law or, or his word being within us, it's very spirit who is a person is within us. Every believer has a resident helper, a resident teacher, a resident comforter, a resident friend who resides in them. Jesus said, 
but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. It's personal because the Holy Spirit lives within us. And then it brings total forgiveness. The new could never do that. Look at verse 12. For I'll be merciful to their iniquities and I'll remember their sins no more. That's the capstone of the new covenant. Here it is. What men want more than anything else, the Old Testament pictured could not give. The, the promise of the Old Testament finally fulfilled. Under that old covenant, sins could never be forgotten because they were never really forgiven. They were only covered. They were only foreshadowed. They were only anticipating true forgiveness that would come in a great high priest, his name being Jesus. But for those who belong to his dear son through the new covenant, God doesn't just forgive, he forgets. And the new covenant, by the way, is for the present. It is for now. Look what he says. A new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. In sharing the gospel with the Jews, whether it's New Testament times or today, one of the biggest stumbling blocks for them is to forget the old covenant and that it is gone. It's no longer valid for them or for anybody else. God doesn't honor that covenant any longer. He's made another one, infinitely better than the first. Uh, through his son, the Jews' only Messiah, it's hard for them to realize that in the Old Testament, or, and I'm sorry, in the Old Covenant, it's laws and that it's just a symbol. It's just a picture of the plans that God had for them. The Old Covenant symbol's not bad. It was never bad. It was beautiful. It had a God-given purpose. It pointed to the Son. It represented the Son. It foreshadowed the Son before He came to earth. But now the Son has come to earth. And the symbol's no longer needed because we have the real thing. By merely saying a new covenant was coming, God was rendering that old one obsolete. Uh, Jeremiah telling us that, that something new is coming, the old one obsolete right then. And so the human writer of Hebrews could not have known uh, that that truth was literally about to be fulfilled in about five years. When Titus and the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, which really this temple had only been completed for a short time, it was the Herodian temple, Herod the Great. Without the temple, there's no altar. Without the temple, there's no Holy of Holies. There could be no sacrifices for the ministering priesthood. And without the priesthood and without its sacrifices, friend, there's no old covenant. It's finished. When verse 13 was written, the obsolete covenant was ready to disappear. And in less than five years, gone. The old sacrificial system actually was over. When the veil was split in two, when Christ died on the cross, the sacrifice was complete. At that moment, Christ's unique, never-to-be-repeated sacrifice was finished as a result of that all men in Christ had direct access to God because Christ was our mediator. He is our mediator. The destruction of the temple completed the closing of the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, if you will, by removing the place of sacrifice that no longer served a purpose. It was done once and for all. The age of the Mosaic Law and the Levitical priests was past, and the age of the Son will last forever. Thanks for joining us. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for a new covenant. Oh, dear God, the demands of that old covenant made us recognize we could never have peace with you because we can never fulfill that old covenant. Only in Jesus and his perfect atoning sacrifice because of a life lived in perfection fulfilled every single aspect of that covenant. He was the symbol to look toward. And when he came, he was the truth. He is the way. He is the life. And we thank you for him today. Lord, we thank you for all of your blessings. We pray for our people, wherever they are during this time, that they are sheltered and that they are safe. More than anything, we are, we are sheltered in the very arms of God. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
God loves you, and I love you.